Oh, what is up, guys, and welcome to the Meeple Minded Podcast, the podcast where we talk all things tabletop gaming. My name is Jason. And I'm James. How are you doing this week, James, despite the fact this is the second episode we're recording this week? Indeed. <laughs> How are you? How's your voice holding up? Because we don't usually do two in one week. Mine's fine. Yours isn't. No, mine's not. <laughs> because I also managed to go and do uh, our good friend Anthony's MTVB podcast as well. So yeah, my voice is not great. Shut. It is a, it is a little bit. Didn't help that we had a game night last night, which had us you know, shouting and screaming as well, did it? Yeah. What game did we play last night, James? Ooh, spoilers. Yeah, spoilers. Spoilers. I'm excited for it, I spoilers. don't care. What game <laughs> we, did we play? We played Starship Captains. We did, our very first play of Starship Captains. We got a teach from Wayne and Simon of the Board Stupid podcast, so thank you guys for introducing us to that game and setting us on our path of discovery. Indeed. And uh, probably getting lots and lots of people to play that game. Yeah. Because that was very, very fun. And I got pipped at the post right at the last minute by one and a half points. And I'm not salty or sour about that at all, Simon. <laughs> uh, I came last. Yeah, you, you, you did. You did. But... I did. But, James, there was only, what, four or five points between... Yes, winning, indeed. ...winner and, and loser, so not too bad. We shall enjoy uh, exploring that game a few... Well, a few more times over the coming weeks and expect an episode of us talking about that in... Probably in the new year at this point, because we're starting to wrap up for this year soon. But, um, yeah, th this episode that we're doing today, James, this is the one that we were meant to be doing and releasing what would now be last week if you're listening to this podcast but we're having to do it this week because we shoehorned in that games workshop episode yes <laughs> wasn't that fun oh it was I, i'm not surprised my voice is, is hurting a little bit but <laughs> hey ho what can we do Th this one james is is one that i've been looking forward to doing because this one is i guess it's kind of christmas related that we are doing it at this time of year but this is also you know gift ideas for throughout the year isn't it really yeah now, I sent you away to come up with 10 gift ideas yep. for a gamer that wasn't basically more games. And I also had to do the same. We've compiled our list here yep. down into 10 things. And we, we've mixed a couple of those things so that they become one category. But how did you find actually making the list? Was it challenging? I found it challenging. Yeah? Is there, is there a particular reason? Yeah. What's that? Because when you take games out of the equation, it becomes very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, on the other hand, managed to write a nice big long list. But then as we discussed, it's like, well, a couple of the things were just cheaper versions of another thing that was on the list. Yeah. Or they all fit into one overarching category, which is what we've ended up doing anyway. Exactly. So pretty much everything that we wrote down has ended up on this list. So it's a lot more than 10 things. Yeah. But we're going to give you 10 categories and ideas of things within that category that you could buy for someone who's like me, for example, who has got hundreds of games. And it's a bit risky for someone who may not know my, I don't know, my, my library. My, my my library my choice in games so this is a safe bet load of things for, for people to buy so shall we dive into it james let's do it let us do it Okay, James. So we're going to be counting down uh, a list of things that people can do here, but we're not going to do this in any particular order, are we? No, no, we're not sort of basically saying that, you know, when we get to the end of this list, that is the must, must buy thing. This is just in a random order. Just buy everything. Yep. I think that, that's, that's the, cl the clue here. Buy everything that's on the list. And trust me, they will love you. Oh, they will. Because <laughs> there's a lot. Your bank won't. But... <laughs> Your bank won't, yeah. So, yeah, in no particular order... The first thing that we've got on our list here is game upgrades. Yes. Now, this is something I think very close to both of our hearts. Yep. Uh, what do we mean by game upgrades? Well, think of uh, think of things like metal coins or upgraded tokens, for example. You know, if, you, yep. if you've got a game like Scythe, for example, and you haven't got the deluxe version, you know, it's cardboard tokens for coal and, and all that kind of stuff. There are upgrades out there that have nice 3D wooden pieces. You've got things like minis that you could buy for a game that only has standees. Yep. You've got uh, scenery pieces for those war games. Yep. And also one of my favorite things, and this was one that I actually had as a separate thing, but actually it fits nicely here, a nice clay set of poker chips. 
Yes. Now, that doesn't mean they have to play poker, does it, James? No, because um, it's an alternative to uh, the metal coins, because yes. as you found out when you bought your bag of metal coins, sometimes, it's, uh, Simon pointed this out last night, sometimes they're more expensive, and you might as well just use pound coins. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think when I got mine, I, I paid a pound per metal coin, and it was just sort of like, I could just turn up with a hundred pounds in pound coins and we'll play with that. <laughs> but yeah, clay poker chips. I, I love the idea because you get them, they nearly always come in a really nice carry case. Yep. They have that really nice sound to them as well. They've got a nice weight to them. They're, they usually got a, a numerical marking on them mm-hmm. so that yes, you, you, they've got ones, fives, Tens, tens, twenties, fifties, hundreds, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, which are the common denominations that you're going to use. And I think the overarching way to think about this category is if you buy the retail version of a game, more often these than not, these components are punch board yep. and standees, like you said, which mm-hmm. are perfectly serviceable, but having these upgraded components just make the games pop. Yeah, agreed. Um, I, I've always been a bit of a sucker for deluxification within games, especially when I'm back in games. But there are some games that are in my collection, for example, that I haven't deluxified. But what I'm actually doing is building a basically a, a box of deluxified components that can be used for any game. Yeah. The metal coins, for example, they're very generic, um, which means, okay, I could break out a game of Dice Theme Park. Uh, I don't know. Ark Nova. Ark Nova. Wacky races, Savannah Park, whatever it be. I could break out any game and I could plonk those coins down on the table and they would fit, uh, which is another good thing with the poker chips. They're kind of, they're very generic. Um, that would be the one thing I would say. You know, there are many, many metal coins out there with lots of different themes. If you're not buying it for a specific game you know they like, try and make them as generic as possible so that they can then be used with multiple games. Any component can be upgraded in the game, basically. There's there's some third-party supplier out there that will sell it. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, I mean, maybe not so much in the UK, but I know places like Etsy and that, they are huge in the USA and other parts of the world. They are a great place to find third-party upgrades yep. for games. So that's, uh, that's one of the best places, I would say. But, yeah, let's move on to number two, James. Okay, so... For number two, we have table upgrades. Ooh, yes. So are you talking about buying a whole new table? I... I mean, you could buy I a board we, game I, table if you I, like. I was going to say, I think we should insert at this point that, no, we are not recommending that you buy someone a premium board game table. <laughs> as much as they will love you to the end of time, oh, don't yes. do it. They're expensive. Oh, <laughs> very, very. Even the cheap ones are expensive. Yeah. But so I what, mean, if you've got the money, you've got board game tables, you, you've even got table toppers. They're, they're still quite expensive. But yeah, that's not what we're talking about here, Jason. No, 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 it's not. So what are we talking about, Jason? Okay, so the first one that I put on this, and this was probably my favourite, one because I love the name, Mm -hmm. but also because I really want one, and that is to have a Lazy Susan. Now, for those of you that don't know what I mean by Lazy Susan, and James was one of these uh, Uh, earlier. As soon as I described it, you knew what I was talking about. But a Lazy Susan is just something you can plonk down in the middle of the table, for example, and it's essentially a rotating Platform. platform that you would have on the table. So we were playing Red Rising, the other day, James. Yep. And that has a central board that it's, depending on where you're sat, is quite difficult to read. Whereas it's small enough to sit nicely on top of a small Lazy Susan. So no matter whose turn it is, you can just turn it slowly to face me. I can do what I need to do. My turn's over. I turn it to the next player. It's also a really good way of distinguishing whose turn it is. Yep. So that was uh, that was my first contribution, James. It was. Uh, we also have Dice Trays and Dice Towers. Oh, yes. I think you had these as one particular yeah. uh, thing, but I, I split them up, and this is what I was talking about. Is like You've obviously got the dice trays, which can be as cheap as you like or as expensive as you like. Yeah. Or you've got the dice towers, which tend to be more on the higher end of the scale, but they are all about rolling dice. Yeah. And then we also have card holders and table organizers. Nice. So what do we mean by those, James? So most of these games will have what we shall call general supplies, and these yep. are these can take the form of both card draw decks and 
tokens, resources, all of that kind of stuff, which usually end up just in random piles on the table. And they look a bit of a mess, and they yeah. tend to get sprawled all over the place, don't they? Yeah, so they are, in essence, simple plastic holders where you can just group all the stuff together and have them in one place on the table, preferably where everyone can reach it, and you can just say, oh, right, there you go, yep. there you go, there you go. And it stops tokens from... Because inevitably, especially with the tokens, not so much with the cards, but definitely the tokens, they inevitably, as people are drawing from, they get spread out and they start to wander off. Yeah. And these things also help greatly when it comes to packing away games as well, because yep. it's like, well, everything's in one place. <coughs> uh, I haven't got to look around the entire table trying to find things. Um, the card holder one is probably one of my favourite ideas here, James, because yep. a lot of people, especially if they're not sleeved cards, a lot of people do struggle to grip cards and, and separate them without having to draw two cards. Whereas if you've got a nice card holder, it makes just drawing a card nice and easy. You just slide off the top card yep. without the fear of the entire deck falling over. And again, uh, on the same thing with poker chips, is as long as, depending on your game's card size... If you don't want a gaming brand one, which can tend to be a bit more expensive, a poker draw yep. uh, thing would work. But you have to watch the card sizes with that. So yeah, I think that's uh, that's that about covers us for table upgrades, doesn't it, James? Indeed it does. Um, just general things that you think might keep the table nice and tidy during gameplay and make it a darn sight easy to pack these games away at the end. Sticking with the table theme, James, let's go to the personal player area section that we've come up with here. And much like the table upgrade section, this is going to have upgrade sections that makes the player experience far, far better. Now, there's some of these that might sort of carry over a little bit. For example, we're going to talk about card holders. Yep. Now, where we were talking just now about deck holders that hold decks... When I talk about card holders, I'm talking about basically either an MDF or plastic piece of, uh, I guess okay. it's like a strip, and then it has like yeah. Every time, a strip. every time I've tried to describe this, the only thing that pops into my head is think of Scrabble. The thing you use to hold your letters. Yeah, yeah. Except it's got cards slotted into it instead of letters. Yeah, exactly. Something along those lines. There's a, an abundance of them out there. It's basically a piece of material that's got a very thin slit in it to hold a card yep. up vertically. This is not going to be for everyone. I personally like to hold my cards because I'm very old school like that. However, it actually does work, you know, and this works really nicely for people that play uh, board games. It works for people that play war games, and it definitely works for people that play card games like pokemon where you usually have quite a large hand size and it's a bit of a pain to keep shuffling through your cards to see what you've got whereas these you can have them all nicely laid out in front of you and you can see at a glance exactly what you have in your hand yep i love me some of those red rising comes with yeah comes um, with those another one another game that comes with them is nemesis they, yep. they provide you with them uh, which is great and they are very useful in that game so yeah any game any game that requires you to have a fairly large hand of cards they are very useful what else have we got in this uh, in this section james okay so kind of some crossover from the last one but you also have your uh, resource holders which function largely the same way as the general supply but you have a section for your personal resource yeah. pile as well so i suppose that they're one and the same thing yeah really i mean a lot of the um a lot of the ones i've seen will actually combine a card holder and a resource holder you'll usually have like three very shallow wells yeah follow yeah you know, and then topped with a with a card holder so it's, you can get an all-in-one unit i guess yeah but yeah they they the the resource holders tend to be a bit more shallow so that you know you're not storing them in it yeah, or, or having large quantities in it, but there's enough there to, to sort of have... A, your, a your, decent... per, your personal supply, yeah. And we also have, in this section, custom dice. Oh, yes. Now, you custom know, dice. Custom dice. This covers, again, your board gamers. What board game does not have dice in it somewhere? Yeah. Um, it covers your war gamers, definitely, and your role players, you oh, know. Yes custom d20s yeah exactly and i mean that's going to be the confusing thing that you know if, if you're not super into gaming yourself it might you know if they're into role play games they usually sell role play dice as a set yeah uh, which will include all of the different types of dice that are used within role play you know your d20s your d10s your d6s d3s d4s d8s, d8s. there's so many different dice that are used within role play that maybe not so much in the others yeah so if you've got someone who solely plays board games one of those sets probably wouldn't be as usable as you might think yeah uh whereas a nice big set of 
brightly colored or, or or even metal d6 dice would wouldn't go amiss Every, everyone loves a nice looking dice yes on the tabletop uh, war gamers i'm not as super up to date on them as i do but everything is basically done by rolling yep and that so tends to be d6s from your pri- your primary dice for rolling will be d6s mm-hmm However, their D, D10s, D20s have snuck in, uh, but they are primarily used for wound trackers. Yes. Uh, and that is definitely something that's worth saying as well. If you just want to buy some D20s, mm. they're usually pretty good for wounding yep. and wound trackers and stuff like that. Uh, and that works for board games as well. Yes. Because if you've got characters that have got multiple wounds, there's nothing wrong with having a big wound die sat right next to them with their current state. So yeah, dice, really good choice yep. for upgrades. And they don't tend to be, you know, they can be, they can vary in price from a couple of quid up to, well, I mean, hundreds for some really top end dice. But yeah, and as J- as Jason said, if you are unfamiliar with the board gaming or with the gaming world in general and you want to know what we're talking about when Jason says D6, D8, D20, D for dice, and the number is the side of faces it's got. So uh, the one that everyone's going to be familiar with is a D6. It's a six-sided yeah. dice. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so moving on to our number four. We're now talking about gaming surfaces. Yes. Now, we touched on a little bit earlier about board game tables. They are horrifically expensive gaming surfaces that are fantastic. However, there are some much, much cheaper options, James. There are indeed. We have one in front of us right now, which we will talk about. Yep. But let's start with the generic one that I think can be used with pretty much every game. And that is neoprene mats. Yep. They come in all shapes and sizes from card game ones, which are maybe what? two foot by two foot uh, or two foot by one foot whatever they also go right up to wargaming size of yeah six by six by four so there's a lot of scope here for different game surfaces the the print on them can be different you can get custom ones if you're really feeling flush uh uh, but the the key thing here is they are a really nice soft surface that gamers like to use because when you roll dice on it you don't get that horrible clattering yep you don't damage your dice you if you're using miniatures and they fall over they don't chip paint they don't damage the miniatures uh if you're using cards you're playing cards on them it gives you a nice soft surface that you can press down on to lift the cards up Yep. And it just saves bending cards as well. So all around neoprene mats are really, really good. Yep. And they also function, a lot of board games have a neoprene mat upgrade so that rather than a solid board, you have a nice rollout mat. Yep. But let's talk about the surface that we currently have on this table because this is, at a glance, very, very similar to a board game table. Yes. Uh, But what we have here cost me about 10 quid in total. And what these are, they are foam um, with, I, I don't want to say felt on the top, but it's, it's sort of like carpet material. There's a very thin layer of carpet material on top of the foam. Yep. But they are interlocking foam tiles. Yeah, I've seen people use these things for all sorts, usually to protect a hard floor from yes. something. Is the like um, our friend Adam used to have one, uh, ha- have them in his garage for, uh, I think he had gym equipment on top of it to yep. stop it from leaving grooves yep. in yep. in the floor uh you used to have it when you drummed i did yeah you know yep. to put under the bass drum so that it, the uh bass drum legs didn't dig into the floor it is i've seen these things used for so many applications but yes on top of a hard dining room table they make a perfect gaming surface they do indeed and the good thing is they pack away nice and nice and quickly because you literally just tear them up pile them up, set them aside. I personally store a six by four gaming tables worth inside of a standard, you know, one pound bag that you can go to a supermarket and buy. Yep. And it, it, it weighs next to nothing because it's a very, very lightweight foam. Yeah, they are literally foam. Yeah. Uh, and they've, um, when Jason says they're interlocking, they've basically got like a jigsaw pattern on the, around the outside. So they just clipped it, snapped together. Exactly. And, it, and they also usually will come with... An edge. Uh, an edge as well, which if you're not going to be uh, 
attaching more to it you can attach the edge on it which then gives you a nice soft surface to rest your arms on it's a really good cheap idea for gaming it doesn't have to go on a table as james said these things are designed to go on the floor in fact when you go on to companies like, or websites like amazon for example that's exactly how they advertise them yeah they advertise them as interlocking foam floor tiles yeah they they're, meant, they're meant to go over a, like a hardwood floor if you've got s- stuff on there and you don't yeah. want it to yeah. scrape the, the hardwood or even replace a rug yeah at the end of the day the, you could use this as a rug if you really wanted to so yeah these are a really good cheap option to get yourself a good gaming surface they're transportable they're lightweight so you haven't got to worry about having a big six six foot by four foot neoprene heavy mat on your back you can carry these along its side and as i said this is cheap these are very very cheap even at their highest cost i think they're about 25 30 pounds a pack yeah Uh, but you usually get nine or ten in a pack so they're pretty good pretty good indeed one foot by one foot foam floor tiles for gaming surfaces number five james halfway through the list this is another one that we are totally into and that is storage 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 now we're going to try and cover as many different aspects of the hobby here aren't we james yes would you like to kick us off with whatever you want to talk about Okay, uh, storage. We have uh, gaming bags, and these cover all sorts of things from multiple um, companies. They can be used to store board games. They can be used to store your wargaming miniatures. Mm-hmm. Uh, and hand in hand with that is foam as well to put in them to yep. protect yep. Uh, things while they're in transit. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. The, the, the bags especially, I, I am a huge advocate of these. I've got multiple for my board game uh, transportation. Yes, of course, you can take a, ba- a box and stick it in a carrier bag and carry it with you. They're not waterproof. They tend to have a big gaping hole at the top, obviously, because that's how you put shopping in. And yeah, there's no padding, nothing like that. Whereas with regards to specially designed game bags, just talking on the board game front, they usually have padded edges. They usually hold up to eight, nine games. They become quite heavy at that point, I will say, but they do it perfectly because they're designed to hold the weight. They have extra reinforced straps on them. Going on the war game front, yeah. I was a huge, huge fan of battle foam. Yeah. I still have multiple cases. Uh, I've I've got a battle foam case for my um, heresy stuff and battle battle foam foam yeah. as well yeah. to go with it, which is, you know, it's a godsend for those are very expensive, very nicely painted minis that I then want to transport around and don't want them to get broken. Yeah, exactly. And obviously we're fans of battle foam. However, in the past we've used Feldia. Yep. We've used Games Workshops cases. Yeah, they're, they're, I mean, uh, Tabletop Tyrant, there's, there's loads. Yeah, there's lo- loads of different brands, just so we're not accused of favouritism. But yeah. per- personally, both of us own and love Battle Foam. Yeah, 100%. Um, and just to give you a slightly cheaper option for board game storage here as well on the bags, board game bags tend to be... 50 pounds and up uh, however the slightly cheaper option and i use these myself as well as my official board game bags is the is it kan drums k-a-j-u-n yes um drum bags they fit they basically those drums are the same size in width and height as a board game so you can fit multiple games inside a cayenne box bag and uh, yeah that's a really good cheap option i think i got my first two were about 10 or each no, that's good. So there you go. Cheap options. Uh, another thing that I think I want to touch on here, James, yep. is something that we are a huge, huge fan of here. Oh, yes. I think I know where we're going with this one. We do. We're talking about box inserts. Box James. inserts. Yes. You might hear us mention them when games actually come with them. Yes, indeed. Or, or don't come with them. Yes. For, for that matter. But yeah, box inserts. These aren't something that come standard with every game, and they do usually help with setup, teardown, and kind of helps with the whole table organization as well. With a lot of box inserts, they can be taken out and used as a as table, table organizer. organizer. Not always, but sometimes. If you have a player, for example, who is constantly banging on about that one game yep. that they really love, let's say, pick random one off my shelf, James. Let's say... Arc Nova. Arc Nova. That's a very good one, because that one does actually have a box insert. I've been banging on about Ark Nova constantly, but one of the things I've also said is, oh, the, the setup is really, it's a really bit of a pain. Okay, cool. A box insert would really help with that. Yeah. Because it's going to keep all of those cards in there safe. 
while it's being transported or even being stored. Because you store games vertically like I do, things tend to fall out quite yep. a lot. And when things fall out, things get bent, they get damaged, never good. A box insert deals with that. Now, again, box inserts fluctuate in price. You've got your foam box inserts for folded space, which tend to be anywhere between 10, 20, 30 quid as a maximum for the really big box games. Then you've got your MDF box inserts, which can be anywhere from 20 to 50 pounds. You could buy 3D printed one or pre 3D printed ones, which will again fluctuate in price. Yep. Um, I mean, if you've got a 3D printer, why not? 3d print an insert for them it yep. will just take you time and obviously filament costs box inserts are a nice easy thing to actually get for someone if you know yep. what games they have and while this isn't always the case most of the time they take any expansions that game has into account so you're yep. also actually reducing them storage space most of the time um i don't personally own it but I know like the Nemesis one, for example, a lot of the Nemesis ones, you can fit the base game and at least two of the other expansions in the base game box. Yeah. So you're immediately cutting me down two boxes. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good example, James, because the the, the box insert that actually comes with Nemesis is really good. It is indeed. And so I, why I was, when you asked for an example, I was like, well, there's Dice Forge and well, you don't need a box insert for that because it comes with a really good one. Yes, indeed. But as you've just said, one game that you have that has that box insert can be upgraded. Yes, it can. So definitely. I mean, it's, it's a very good box insert, but it is... I'm not going to use the word cheap, but it is just a vacuum formed one. It will not last forever. So eventually I will need a proper one, but, and it only includes the base game component. So if I wanted to expand it, well, that's a whole nother box. Yes, exactly. Whereas the aftermarket ones, they've sort of, they've taken that into account and somehow managed to fit it all in the base game box. Oh yeah. Which is phenomenal. Trickery. Yes. Wizardry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah, let, let's not harp on box insets too much because I, I do think that they are a very good and potentially cheap option. Yep. Um, but talking of potentially cheap options, we have one more thing that I want to talk about that I have come to use with pretty much all of my games, James. I have one here in front of me. Yep. And that is, I know them as X bands. They can be um, known as box bands. They can be known as board game box bands. They they have many, many different names. Different materials are used, James. But the one I have here, for example, is essentially an, a, a very big elastic band yep. that splits to be yep. to basically being an X and it wraps around the entire box, yep. around each side of the box and holds the box lid and box base together so that when I store my games vertically, the lid doesn't start to come away and allow the components on the inside to start falling out. These things have saved me more time setting up games than anything else I think I own within my collection. Yeah. And these little rubber ones that I have here, these cost me, I think, £15 for about 50 of them. Yep. So they're very, very good. You can, as I said, get them in different materials. There are really nicely designed ones, which come in like a sort of, I suppose Velcro is probably the best, the best way. They, they attach to each other by Velcro. They're obviously a bit thicker, so you're not going to store as much on a shelf, but they are, they look better. They look more professional, yep. uh, but they're also quite a bit more expensive. But yeah, any kind of, I mean, you could buy someone a box of elastic bands if you wanted. A big box of elastic bands just to put round the box. But yeah, anything that's going to hold boxes closed when they are stored vertically or even horizontally when they're in transport, whatever it be, they are a godsend and vary in price depending on your budget. Cool. So um, we're sort of sticking with the same theme here, but with a slightly different um, category. We are into game protection. Oh, yeah. And the big one that I, I had this in my little list followed by lots and lots of exclamation marks because um, if you know a gamer whose games comprise largely of cards, they will thank you for buying them card sleeves. Yes. This is the first one under gaming protection. The caveat here, James, and I think you're actually spot on with this one, and that is by all means have a guess, but don't expect to be right. Yeah. And as such, keep the receipt. Yes. Or get a gift receipt. 
so that if you have chosen wrong and they can't make use of those card sleeves somewhere else, they can at least exchange them for what they need. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably the best way. I, I yeah, would. I think, I mean, I, I I brought this up when we were making this list. You know, we've gone through several of these sections where it's like, if you don't know, it's like, I, I would say as a rule, and this is outside the hobby sector, it's always get a gift receipt because sometimes mm. you can pick wrong and yep. although the thought is appreciated, it's just, well, you were slightly off. Yep. I need, I, I, if you don't want to spoil the surprise, yep. but you have got me the wrong thing. So it's like... It was- I mean, I guess the, the other thing is we're talking about making or purchases for someone who already has most things or even, you know, it, it is a someone who just likes to spend their own money. Yeah. You may miss that they already have the thing that you're buying them. So it may not, it may be useless to them, but that gift receipt yeah. doesn't tell them how much you paid for it, so you don't have to feel guilty about spending too much or too little or, or anything like that. Okay, so this one is probably heavily for the board gamers out there, as I think a lot of things on this list have been, to be fair. And that is, maybe they don't like metal coins and things like that, or, or maybe the tokens that are in that game are not they don't have anything that really suit them on an upgrade so what can you do and this works under protection and game upgrades james and that is coin capsules now i first came into coin capsules probably about two three years ago and it wasn't something i'd really thought about because coin capsules are for coin collectors ultimately um taking an old heritage coin putting it inside a coin capsule to preserve it the good thing with board games is their tokens tend to be about the same size as a coin which means they fit nicely in coin capsules and what would be a standard punch board token which will eventually start to peel up and things like that you clamp it inside of a nice plastic coin capsule and not only do you thicken that thing that that token up and make it feel better quality you also have a nice hefty piece you get when you throw it down on the table for example it's never going to get damaged it makes a nice noise all that kind of thing, but it just looks better. So coin capsules. Mm. Again, quite a cheap, cheap option. Yeah, very good. Right, after you saying that, you know, we seem to be favouring the board gamers here, Jason, I feel we are about to swerve into wargaming and role-playing territory here. So the first one we've got here, which is number seven. Yeah, we've, we've lost track of yeah. it here, haven't we, James? <laughs> yeah, number words because we didn't write them in order and we decided to shove that. Yeah, we, we, we've been picking things off the list uh, yeah. as, we go, as it made sense. <laughs> So, yeah, so sort we are, of number seven, I think. Yeah, yeah, we are at number seven here, and we have Hobby Supplies. Oh, yes. And this is a very broad... I would say this is definitely very broad. And and yeah, it doesn't really serve the board gamers fully, and it is definitely heavily towards the role play and, uh, and war gamers, but also could work for board gamers. Yeah, the only reason I say that is because I know we're thinking of you as an example, but you started off as a war gamer, so you yeah. already had the bug. I did, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what are we talking about with hobby supplies, James? Okay, so let's go for the first one and probably the most expensive thing on this list, Paint sets. Paint sets, yes. So paint can be purchased as an individual bottle. Yep. Hobby paints come in very, very different types, different shapes, different sizes, different colours. And most of the companies will box them together in sets. Uh, So uh, Games Workshop do it. uh, Army Painter does it. Vallejo Vallejo does does it. uh, You know, for a couple of examples, I think of, you know, the Army Painter ones, you've got the uh, Coloured Metallic set. You've got the um, Metallic set ordinary metallic set you've got the matte set etc shades you've got washes you've got normal paints you've now got speed paints i mean we're just talking about army painter right now james that, yeah yeah that gives you a rough idea of the amount of paints out there uh yeah in games workshop terms they they will bundle that you can buy them in bundles for specific uh armies for specific paint schemes all that kind of stuff um vallejo is very similar to army painter in the 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 way they divide up their box sets or you can get the jumbo have the entire range yeah the all-in set yeah Yeah. where you get literally everything i will talk touch on very quickly on other hobby paints because you can go to somewhere like Hobbycraft here in the UK. Yep. Um, most hobby paints are acrylic based. Not all, but most are acrylic based. And of course, artist paints are also acrylic based. Now, I know, James, this isn't your wheelhouse because I do a bit more painting than yourself. Yep. But just to touch on it very, very quickly, miniature paints tend to be a lot more pigmented. 
than artist paints. I believe it, I think it's that way around. And they tend to use much, much less in the way of, of paint. And they come in much smaller pots, but yeah. they are about the same size. So don't be caught out by the fact of, oh, well, this acrylic paint gives me 500 mil of paint for three quid. Whereas this Games Workshop paint only gives me, I think it's like 10 mil yeah for five quid yeah that 10 mil will go a lot further <laughs> exactly um and they tend to be far better quality for miniature painting yes whereas if you're talking to someone who maybe exclusively p- builds and paints scenery for like war games and stuff those artist paints are actually better for that yeah so there are different things and if you're talking about or looking at paints that is the kind of thing I probably would try and have a conversation with the person on because it is very very dependent on what they want to use yeah um yeah although you are more of a painter than I am uh, the other you've already touched on it is the uh, miniature painting is acrylic um and if you're going into a generic hobby store there are other miniature uh, paints for things like airfix kits they tend to be enamel based yeah um, a war gamer will not thank you if they. If you, I mean, they <laughs> should know straight yeah. away. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, an enamel paint because once it's on, it's on. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and yeah, because a lot of our miniatures tend to be plastic. Obviously, once you've put enamel paints on, the best way to get that off is white spirit. White spirit will melt plastic. Yep. So, yeah, getting enamel paints off of a miniature is not easy. Avoid enamel unless you have been explicitly told that what enamel paints they want. Yep. Um, so, yeah, that paints is a, is a nice, easy one. I think there's enough sets out there that, you know, if someone, while I use primarily Citadel paints, um, if someone bought me an army painter paint set i i'm not going to be displeased with that no i same mean with vallejo same with the duncan Rhodes paints any yeah. any sort of miniature paints i would be happy to receive it ultimately I, and they tend to be you know, because warhammer is the biggest miniature game out there a lot of the other paint manufacturers will have a citadel comparison chart effectively yeah. to go well yeah if you're buying Vallejo, for example, they, you know they, they'll have something on their website to go. Right, here's the Citadel color. Here's the one of our range that's closest to that color. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So yeah, that's that's paints, James. Yep. What uh, else have we got? Within that, you've also got paint brushes. Yeah, paint brushes. One of those consumables because you know they are they have a certain amount of life before the uh, brush heads start to go. And that you know, yep. so you're no matter how careful you are with them, you eventually have to replace them. Yeah. Uh, the same with hobby knives. Uh, the blades will eventually blend. You know, these are all hobby tools are great for gift ideas because they are consumables. Yeah, they, they will get used. Yeah, no uh, matter how point, yeah. well you treat them, eventually they have to be replaced or have bits replaced. Uh, yep. You know, there are hobby drills, saw all that kind of all that jazz yeah um and obviously you you mentioned that you know being consumable an extension of that i guess um with regards to paintbrushes you could even maybe invest in some i uh, think like brush soap yep and and things like that which is going to prolong the life of the brushes that they're using yep um the reason i i mentioned that is some hobbyists if they're really into their painting will have spent a lot of money yep. on some very good brushes you know Windsor and Newton brushes and even more expensive ones than that they are more likely to sit there and sort of really care for their their brushes they'll put them through brush soap after each use they'll dry them in a certain way and things like that so basically if so if you know someone's into painting or building models yeah model tools paint brushes paint glue yeah glue's a big um, one that's another big consumable you know you these models have to go together somehow exactly so obviously super glue is is probably the most used glue i would say however you can also get plastic glue yeah plastic glue it um, has it has a specific name that i cannot remember yeah no i mean either I, th- I think when you buy the model the ones from the model companies like citadel it is listed yeah, as plastic, plastic glue, glue. So, yeah, you know, super glue could be used on anything. But yep. if they're building exclusively Games Workshop products, I'd personally recommend the plastic glue because it is better in the long term. Yeah. It is harder to use. Yes. Um, so if you're talking for children, I mean, really, you shouldn't be buying glue for children anyway. But yeah, it's a, it's per- I personally build all my models with super glue and there will be some modelers out there who are going <gasps> yes. at that. 
Um, and there are some drawbacks, which I am fully aware of. A super glue is more definitely more brittle. It, yes. The models will not survive being dropped. Mm -hmm. The first thing, even though the bond is technically better, yes, um, they will shatter if yeah. they're dropped or or not uh, not so much knocked over, but definitely dropped. Yeah, whereas plastic glue doesn't suffer from that. The reason for this being that plastic glue doesn't just form a bond; it physically melts the two pieces together. Yes, the downside to that, and it's the reason I don't like using it, is that if you get it on your fingers and then you handle a plastic model, it will start eating at the detail. Yes, and your fingerprints will uh, forever be part of that armor. Indeed, <laughs> uh, which is the main reason why I don't like it. If your model is resin or metal, you don't have a choice. You're using super glue. Yes, plastic glue Pla will not work with those. So yeah, that's uh, that's hobby supplies. Yeah, anything that can be used to to assist in in the production of hobby, especially for those miniature builders out there. Okay, so moving on, this is another one that sort of goes to all different games, I guess, uh, and we've named it game extensions now it's a bit of a weird name i guess but it covers all the ground so we're talking campaign books we're talking codexes for war games we're talking board game expansions but we'll talk about that more in a second if, if you've got someone who plays a card game it never hurts especially if it's something like pokemon or magic never hurts to buy them booster packs of the latest set yeah for example and obviously role play you've got campaign books as well you've got new rule books coming out all the time yeah anything that's going to extend the life of the base version of a game yeah, that's what we're talking about. So, James, where should we start? Uh, let's start with game uh, game expansions first. Okay, cool. Game expansions. This was one that you put down. Yep. Uh, I put down but removed. And then we decided we needed to include it as part of this section. Now, game expansions. This is primarily aimed at the board game aspect. So you know that someone has got a game. Uh, let's uh, We'll take, we'll uh, looking at my shelf, Operation Flashpoint or Fla Flashpoint Fire Rescue. There are a ridiculous amount of expansions for this game, James. You can see that I have at least one there. Yep. Which is uh, Extreme Danger. Now, it's fair to say... I've got an expansion. I've got the base game. I've talked about Flashpoint quite a few times. I clearly like this game. So an expansion is a really good idea to go for to uh, as a present for me. However, my one thing here is to, again, going back to that whole gift re receipt thing, it is very important here because... While James can see that I've got extreme danger, what he doesn't know is there's actually five expansions inside that one box. Which we've already covered. I was going to say that with Root. <laughs> it's like, there's another game that you've got that, uh, oh, I know Jason likes Root. I know there's a lot of expansions for this, but he's got one of those handy dandy box inserts that allows you to compress five uh, expansions into the base game. Indeed. Because someone bought him a nice gift. <laughs> yeah, me. Me. <laughs> I bought myself a nice gift. You bought your <laughs> But yes, so th this is this is where the caveat is for me. If you've got someone who likes those games, just just make sure you get those gift receipts because the chances are they already have the game. They may well have the expansion. There is another caveat to that, James. You know I have Inish. Yep. You also know that I'm constantly saying how much I want the expansion for that. Yep. If I'm saying I want the expansion for it, it's fair to assume you don't have I it. I don't have the expansion. So if that's the case, knock yourself out. Was that a hint? It might have been a hint. <laughs> Christmas is coming, James. <laughs> Much like the dragons in Game of Thrones. They're coming and they're going to be great. <laughs> so yes, there we go. That's that's uh, part one. What's next? Yeah, uh, so we've done game expansions. So there are... Uh, we've used the Games Workshop terminology here, the, uh, the codexes and campaigns... Most of the major war games have this. Games Workshop definitely have this. They are regularly releasing new codexes for armies, new campaign books that will cover those armies, that will give you new scenarios and new rules. These will never hurt no. if you know the person doesn't have them. The campaign books especially, um, because they're just adding some fluff and some uh, a few extra rules to the armies. Uh, and the same goes, you know, campaign books also apply to uh, role players. There are always campaign books coming out for games like D&D. Uh, to give you new scenarios, new ways of creating characters, etc., etc. Yep. No, I completely agree with that. Indeed. So basically, game extensions, anything you think will extend the life of the game 
system that they play, it's never going to hurt to, to purchase those those gifts. Uh, the next one's a nice easy one and is actually something that I've asked for on my Christmas list this year, which is um, gaming convention tickets. Yep. The UK Games Expo is huge here in the UK. I like to go every single year and I like to go for the duration of the weekend. That makes it not expensive, but with my hotel stay becomes a very expensive uh, weekend away. So maybe if someone wanted to buy me the gaming convention tickets, that eases the burden on me. Yeah. And you know that the UKG is a very UK specific one. Um, you've obviously got Essen yeah. in Germany, Gen Con, Gen Con. In, the, in, the, in, in the States. You've got all of the Dice Tower Cons. Yeah. And, and that's just to name some big ones. Uh, if you're really feeling flush, you could buy some of the Dice Tower Cruise tickets. Um, <laughs> but you know a gaming convention of some sort or a gaming event that you know they want to attend it, it's just a nice thing to sort of give someone a nice day out or even a weekend to to do these things and just ease the burden a little bit on the cost yep that's a good one and number 10 yes number 10 so this one is i guess the most light-hearted one on here and the most open-ended one yep. on here because we're going to talk about gaming themed apparel stuff yep tat things things everything if it's got a gaming theme to it, and you'll see what we mean in a minute. Exactly. So the first and obvious one, T-shirts, James. T-shirts, yep, t-shirts. and actual apparel. Yep, you, you, they're all over, what do they call it, the Amazon stores. Amazon store, you know, we, we've got stuff. We've yep. got stuff on Redbubble. Uh, our, our newsman, Paul, creates these things. You know, he's got, you know, mugs, T-shirts, hoodies, notepads, probably clocks and, I don't know, fingerprints. Uh, who knows? You can <laughs> yeah. get anything with a theme on it. Yeah. You just do a Google search and you'll get probably four million pages of stuff. Yep. Glasses. Glasses. Yep. Beer, beer glasses. Beer glasses. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Wine glasses. Yeah. Pick your poison. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it will have some kind of graphic on it to do with gaming or, you know, gaming terminology or yep. imagery, that kind of thing. Exactly. And this works perfectly for all game systems. You know, it does. And does this, is a, play Pokemon, this is a very good, a th- this, this is a very good one for if you've, I don't know, the, not so much the family and friends, but the acquaintances, you know, mm-hmm. are you doing a, your office has decided to do a 10 pound. Uh, oh, Secret Santa or yeah, something. Secret, yeah, Secret, well, not so much Secret Santa because, you know, it might end up going to someone who's not into gaming. But, you know, if you know there's someone in your office you want to buy a little something for as a Christmas present, a colleague or something, and you know they're into games, it's like, here, go have a, have a beer glass. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the couple of things that I've written down here for, for us to talk about was obviously glassware, mugs, yeah. you know, drinking appliances, basically. Don't get someone... Uh, like meeple dinner plate or something like that. It's a bit weird. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I'm sure it's out there. It's a bit weird. It will be somewhere. Exactly. Someone has done it. Yeah. I, I've got drawers upon drawers of gaming themed t shirts that I wear all the time. Meeple minded ones available. Uh, <laughs> had to get it in there. Cha ching. Yep. Coasters. Now, this is something, James, we use it every time. Yep. Right now, we've both got drinks on coasters. They're on horrible football-themed coasters, and I hate football. Um, so I need to get myself some gaming-themed coasters for when we're hosting gaming nights here. It's little things like that. They're nice, cheap, and cheerful things that you can go ahead and buy. Again, a Google search that just says gaming-themed stuff. Stuff. Whatever you, you know, think of something. Just put gaming-themed in front of it. And it will give you lots of yep. board gaming themed or D and D themed or you know, role play theme or whatever. Yeah. It's really easy to find. Doesn't matter where you go. Etsy, Google, uh, Amazon, Amazon, as we said, Redbubble or the if you really wanted to make a custom one, you've got things like Vista print and stuff like that where you can get an image and just print it on whatever you want. Yep. Gaming themed apparel and stuff. Yep. Damn. That was, a, that was a long episode, James. That was. It was a very long episode for us, but then we, we talked about a lot of stuff there. We did. Is there anything else that you want to talk about? Any honourable mentions that we thought of while we were doing this, but we'd already gone past the section? Um, I'm sure we mentioned some, and I've already forgotten what they were. <laughs> um, I, I can remember one, so we'll do it. And this is more aimed at those war gamers out there. Yep. Um, we were talking about hobby supplies. Um, and while it's not really a hobby supply, if you know someone that does role play, but they use miniatures, 
Yeah. Or they play the war games. Stuff for basing miniatures, you know, flock. Grass yeah. flock, uh, sand. Yeah. I mean... Rocks. Yeah. Do, do you want to buy someone a bag of sand? You know, have they been a bad boy this year? A bag of coal. Yeah. Sorted. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Bad person, Jason. A bad, bad person. person. Yes, bad person indeed. Yeah, stuff like that. You go into a Games Workshop store, for example, they'll have all that kind of stuff will be there. Yeah. It may not be something they'll use, but they'll probably use at some point. Just that kind of stuff. Uh, little bits here and there. Cool. Other than that, I don't think of anything else, and my voice is about ready to give out. Yep. So shall we hand over to the man in the new shed? We will hand over to the man in the new shed. We'll come back and see you in a momento. Brian, you say you've reworded this carol a little bit then? There's no rudy words in there, is there? You sure? Double sure? Okay, well let's have a run through then, but I still don't trust you. Well, cheek or no cheek, your history precedes you, young man. Right, let's go. Oh, Jingle Bells, Monopoly smells, Ark Nova is the game for me. Oh, what fun it is to find, clank catacombs under the tree. Jingle Bells, Monopoly smells, let's slipstream in heat. Because all those scores on BGG, James is still the one to beat. Dashing through a game of scythe, yep I've got out all my max. Oh, where the fields we go. The factory's what I'll take. Simon is quite hungry. Crowdfunding all its plastic. You give them all your money, which in all just seems quite drastic. Oh, jingle bells, monopoly smells, Ganshon clever makes me scream. Oh, what fun it is to find flame craft under the tree. Jingle bells, Monopoly smells, yet another delivery for Jason. Where on earth are we supposed to sit? Where we're trying to eat Christmas dinner. Oh, okay. Not too bad. No Rudy words as promised, although you did get Monopoly in there a few times. Well, and Simon, you're right there. Right, last news of the year, then gaming. Gaming and a bit more gaming, young man. Hit it. The first of a few games that piques my interest from the recent PAX Unplugged event over in the States is Power Plants, an upcoming 2023 garden themed, puzzly area control game for one to five players from Adam E. Dalton, who brought us Fall of the Mountain King and is being published by Kids Table Board Games. In Power Plants, you are a wizard, growing a shared garden of magical plants with your rivals. Each turn, you choose one of the patch tiles from your hand and add it to the growing garden. You can activate the added tile for its dynamic plant power, or activate all the tiles it touches for their slightly weaker, but still very cool, grow powers. As the fields expand, you strategically deploy your sprites to gain control of more and more of the fantastic flora. Will your magical horticulture skills pay off? Power Plants is a very thinky, yet it plays very quickly and has a tough, interesting choices when it comes to placing tiles and deciding which tiles to activate. The latest prototype of Endeavour Deep Sea was on show, which to all accounts is a re-implementation of Endeavour Age of Sail, from designers Carl DeVisser and Jarrett Gray, and being co-published by Burnt Island Games and Grand Gamers Guild. A teaser of Endeavour Deep Sea did make a small appearance at Gen Con, but the full prototype was on show as they approached their game found launch early in the new year. In Endeavour Deep Sea, you head an independent research institute with the goal of developing sustainable projects and preserving the fragile balance of marine life. Throughout the game, you'll recruit field experts and use their abilities to explore new locations, research dive sites, 
publish critical ecological papers and launch conservation efforts. So by expanding your expertise, developing your team and learning as much as possible about the sea. The action your institute takes now could mean a healthy ocean and a sustainable future for the planet. The deep sea exploration theme is strong and interwoven very well within the game mechanisms in Endeavour Deep Sea. You'll be diving to explore the deep sea, performing research, then using your research to publish papers and compete conservation projects. With multiple tracks and specialists, and the addition of being able to promote your specialists in this version, Endeavour Deep Sea seems like it will be highly replayable. And that's not even mentioning the scenario based mechanics and its modular board set up thrown into the mix. City of the Great Machine is a one versus many Victorian steampunk themed game for one to four players from German Tikhomirov and Crowd D Games. City of the Great Machine is a one to four player, one versus many strategy game set in a grim universe of technocratic Victorian steampunk. With asymmetric gameplay and unique victory conditions, playing cooperatively or indeed solo with a game AI. The game features the conflict between the Great Machine, an artificial intelligence network and an alliance of heroes. The Great Machine is either controlled by a player or is indeed automated, which completely changes the gameplay. The Great Machine controls the city built on mobile platforms in the sky, as the Great Machine, the player or indeed the game AI commands a force of perfected servants and mechanical guards. The Great Machine's ultimate goal is to suppress social unrest and complete its grandiose master plan to perfect mankind. And we move on from PAX and Ares Games announced the distribution partnership with French game publisher Don't Panic Games to distribute the English edition of their game Fighters of the Pacific. Fighters of the Pacific is a fast paced and easy to learn tactical board game of naval air battles set during World War II in the Pacific Theater. The game was successfully funded on Kickstarter back in June 2021 and will release to retail in February 2023 after the Kickstarter fulfillment is completed. No dice, no rulers, only dozens of planes and ships, Fighters of the Pacific is designed to provide an intense feeling of frantic air battles. The fast-paced and streamlined game mechanics plunge you straight into the heart of the battle. Sustain in formation to keep the initiative and dominate your opponent. Each plane has its own attributes in terms of speed, armour and special abilities. Paizo loves to give away free content for all its Pathfinder games in the guise of Pathfinder bounties, serving as short standalone adventures still 2020, with this in set to continue well into 2023 with the announcement of Pathfinder quests. These will replace the previous bounties and offer roughly two hours worth of gaming for your groups with each one. This will allow us to give the adventures more in-depth stories while still giving you something that can be played under strict time constraints. The biggest difference is that quests will be tied more deeply into Pathfinder society than bounties. And much like Pathfinder society scenarios will assume your PCs are all Pathfinders. They will reward half as much credit as a scenario, 2 XP, 5 treasure bundles and 2 reputation. Quests will have level ranges similar to scenarios, for example the first one they are working on is for levels 1 to 4. The first of Pathfinder quests is set to release sometime in April and may involve an, an Eldori sword lord. In addition to that quest, Paizo is aiming to have two more quests out by the end of 2023. Last week we mentioned Rhino would be smashing his way onto the tabletop for Marvel Crisis Protocol and how we were expecting other friends and foes of the web slinger to not be too far behind. Well, just like that, Atomic Mass Games have revealed another pack coming to Marvel Crisis Protocol, featuring Agent Venom and Spider-Woman. Flash Thompson drops into Crisis Protocol as Agent Venom, who carries out deadly missions while being bonded to the otherworldly symbiote known as Venom. As well as taking on tasks here on Earth, Ancient Venom can also get stuck into some spacefaring adventures when working alongside the Guardians of the Galaxy. In the pack with Agent Venom, we also have Jessica Drew, who dives into the fighting as Spider-Woman. 
She is trained in striking from the shadows and can use her spider venom strike to bring down her foes wherever they may be. And we all love the cutesy world of Starling Games Everdale, and the only way they could possibly get it any cuter is to introduce us to all those characters' young offspring as they dress up and make believe in My Little Everdale, a more family friendly game aimed to include the younger generation of those aged 6 and up. My Little Everdale has mentioned you take on the role of the kids of Everdale who are looking to make their own make-believe city in the heart of the forest, using worker placement and tableau building mechanics, but with a twist to make them easier to learn, this seems like a fun one to get your kids into the hobby board games, through the lens of something that is undeniably super cute. The game features the same resource management of Everdale, where you'll be collecting all sorts of different things like twigs, resin and berries in order to gain cards from a central market. You'll then spend those resources to buy cards representing places, people and more. These cards then allow you to pick up the parade tiles that offer big victory points that get totted up at the end of the game. My Little Everdale seems to offer up a great way to get that same kick as Everdale, but without the more complicated aspects of gameplay. Everything flows quite easily from turn to turn, with players getting access to new fun things each time. It seems like this might go down well with young ones, and indeed includes a solo mode too. And our main story this week, what with last week's heated discussion and in no way a rant on Games Workshop, what better thing for me to do than to bring you more news from the world of Games Workshop? They did indeed drop a little update for those of you waiting for more content to arrive in regards to the Middle Earth strategy battle game, with the big news is that the Battle of Osgiliath set will be available soon on general release for those that didn't pre-order the game a couple of months ago. The set includes enough treasure to make Smorg blush, not least of which are 54 plastic miniatures representing the forces of good and evil, plus some Osgiliath ruins to battle over. The set itself gets your hands on a collection of the older plastic sprues representing the warriors and rangers of Minas Tirith, alongside the Mornanan orcs that are seeking to destroy the world of men. A big Mordor troll also gets added into the mix with a variety of weapon options too. The new miniatures in the set include Faramir, Madril and Damrod, plus Gothmog who comes on foot and on the back of a fearsome wag. You also have a bunch of sprues representing the ruined city of Osgiliath that can be assembled in a variety of different ways. You can use them to recreate the running battle depicted in Lord of the Rings The Return of the King with the fantastic new Gondor ruins. Despite being a consistent disappointment to his father, Faramir has a range of heroic actions from his time working as a ranger and three will points for resisting magic. The set also comes with the updated rulebook, dice, measuring device and tokens. The neatest addition to the bits and bobs though is the Battle of Osgiliath book which comes with a set of learning scenarios that will walk you through how to play the Middle Earth strategy battle game by taking you through some of the basics of gameplay and then dives into special rules, weapon types, monsters and more. In addition to the Battle of Osgiliath set, there are a few additional releases. For those who want to show their love for a particular faction, there are also themed dice coming out representing both the good and evil forces in those recently released battle host sets. You can get your hands on Rohan and Minas Tirith dice. Or you could be super evil and go with the forces of Isengard and Mordor. Each set comes with 8 dice where the faction symbol takes the place of the 6. You'll always feel happy when that fancy symbol pops up during your games. Although there are only 8 dice in each set, I sense a few folks may pick up one or two each just to have a few more dice for those during gameplay. Not that you ever really roll big handfuls of dice in Middle Earth strategy board game, but as with most things, war is always merrier isn't it? Finally, and rather randomly, there is also the Ring Bearers set coming up for pre-order from the folks at Forge World. The set comes with 5 miniatures in clear resin. You get Frodo, and then both a young and old version of Bilbo. This means that when they slip the ring on, you can represent it on the battlefield in a nifty fashion. You also get Gollum, sneaking about before he lost his precious. Maybe you can use his for all his ill-fated encounter with marauding orcs and the Gadden Fields. 
I am hoping that the Middle Earth Strategy Battle Game team will deliver us some more fun news about what's happening with the game in the near future, come 2023. Games Workshop are sure to give us more supplements, new plastic and resin miniatures, and even rumours that there's a few fun side projects that may be on the horizon too. And let's fly on over to crowdfunding, and over on Kickstarter this week sees us wondering is if we ever feel the need to jump on our pirate ships and blast cannonballs at our friends' ships like there was no tomorrow. Well, you can do all of that with this week's game, Cannonades, by publishers Daminao of Zero Fun. Cannonades is a fast-paced, easy-to-pick-up, chaotic, fun little game for two to five players. It will take about two minutes to teach and play in about 20 minutes. Oh, and it's pretty damn cheap too. Roughly the same as a regular deck of cards, but we are getting ahead of ourselves. In short, each player is the captain of a fleet of pirate ships, and their goal is to sink all of the opponent's ships, with cannonballs of course, and remain the only pirate still afloat. The deck consists of two types of cars, ships and cannonades, each in one of six different colours. During your turn, you can add ships to your fleet or try sinking those of your friends by shooting cannonballs at them. Simple? Yes? As I said, less than 30 seconds, but finding and developing a strategy to have the upper hand might not be so easy. The deck is comprised entirely of two types of cards, ships and cannonades. Both types of cards are divided into six colours based on their strength and rarity, ranging from green, the weakest, to red, the strongest. The ship cards are borderless, while the cannonades have a coloured border. The border identifies the secondary colour of that card, and in turn what ships it can destroy. For instance, the blue cannonade card in the centre can destroy a blue, its colour, or green, its border colour, pirate ship. Some ships are stronger than others, and if damaged or destroyed, they will not go away without leaving their mark. Depending on the strength of the ship, when it's destroyed, it may gain you a benefit by gaining extra cards from the deck or the attacker, revealing your attacker's next ship, and even stronger ships may even gain you the double benefits. So on your turn, add a new ship to your fleet face down, shoot an opponent's ship by playing a cannonade card from your hand and touching an opponent's ship, either face up or down, draw a new card by first discarding one of your own, or go full kamikaze and try destroying an opponent's ship that way. Obviously, last player standing will win. So gather ye crewmates and set sail for those high seas, or a quick game whilst you're down the tavern of choice, whatever floats your boat, so you can get the Cannonade's base pledge for just £11 or €12, Euros, which includes the game, all unlocked stretch goals, and wallpapers featuring Cannonade's fantastic artwork for your desktop and mobile devices. Also, you can pledge for the Glitch Edition featuring an unconventional take on the game's artwork, this set will set you back £18 or €20, Euros, and again includes all stretch goals and wallpapers as mentioned for the base set. Right meeples and meeplesses, you'll hear from me next week in our yearly roundup. But from me personally, and from the duck, we want to wish you all the best. Whatever your plans are for this festive season, may be full of friends, family and of course board games. Want to say anything else Brian? nicely said. Right, say goodbye till next year. And it's a goodbye from me. Keep safe, meeples. Keep those dice rolling, the cards shuffling, and we'll be right here for you in 2023. Thank you very much there, Paul, and thank you guys for joining us once again for another Meeple Minded Show. This time we were talking all about gift ideas and all the things that you should be buying us. Mm. <laughs> the question is, James, how much of this stuff are we going to end up with? None of it, I reckon. I, I, I would agree. I would definitely agree. Well, I mean, the next, obviously, extension to that question is, James, which of these things are you going to buy me? Because, you know, I'm, I'm worth it. I haven't bought you a Christmas gift for as long as we've known each other. This is very true. Or a birthday. You're a really horrible friend, James. I, I mean, I, I'm saying that knowing full well that I'm exactly the same. Indeed. We, we just don't do that. But, um, yes. My, I, I, I mean, my presence is gift enough. 
Oh, well, you, you want to be careful with that head, mate. You, you need to be able to get out of this house this yeah, evening. Exactly, yeah, exactly, you know. <laughs> but anyway, we have been talking for a long time, James. And the entire time that we've been talking... You have had a certain something sitting just off to my left. And I know it's something that you have been desperate to actually see on the table. Yes. So and you, now it's on the table. It's on the table. It's been there for the past hour and a bit. Yep. As we've been talking, James. So is, is that why we've suddenly started rushing? Because you just you, you just couldn't you couldn't bear it anymore. Yeah, yeah. We it's a game. It is a game. We we have heat set up next to us, ready for our very first play of heat. So yeah, first play of Starship Captains last night. First play of heat tonight. I haven't really got much else to say other than I want to get I want to get this game going. Yep. Let's do it. Let's do it. Till next week, guys. My name has been Jason. And I've been James. And you've been listening to the Meeple Minded Podcast. Join us next week for more tabletop gaming goodness. Ta-ta and goodbye.